jump in while Scott's getting his audio fixed. So, uh, hey everybody, this is JJ Cooper on the new Baseball America Hot Sheet. We're very excited to be teaming up with the team from Foul Territory to produce a weekly show that's going to be about all things Baseball America. And if you're new, if you subscribed or if, or if you're thinking about subscribing to the YouTube channel and you say, well, what is all things Baseball America? The best way I can summarize it is it's we want you to know about the stars of tomorrow today. We want you to be smarter than the average fan. We want you to be able to say, I remember when that player, well before that player became Shoei Otani, became Mike Trout, became the best players in the game. And that's what we're going to do regularly here at Baseball America. We're going to cover minor league prospects. We're going to cover college baseball, high school baseball, international baseball. We're going to tell you about the best players in Japan before they come over. We're going to tell you about the players who are going to sign in next year's international class. We're going to tell you about the uh, the stars of the... We're going to talk today about our new Top 100 update that's coming very shortly at TheBaseballAmerica.com. But we're going to give you a little sneak peek here on the Baseball America Hot Sheet Show. And the other thing is, is we want to make sure that you are part of this show. So leave your questions in the comments. We won't get to all of them. Sorry, we can't do that. But we will get to as many as we can. And we will every week try to kind of shape the show a little bit, or at least somewhat, to what you all want to see. So if there's a... If there's a topic that you want us to cover, hey, let us know. We want to hear about it. We want to give you insights into all of the different areas of baseball, all levels of baseball, in a way that hopefully you haven't had a chance to before. And we're going to do that here on the Baseball America Hot Sheet regularly. And I think, Scott, we have you back. Welcome back, Scott. JJ, and you got me? Yeah, now I have you. Hey, Scott. Ah, yes. All right. Let's go. It wouldn't Let's be a first go. show without something like that, would it? <laughs> it would not, of course. Going from one literal YouTube channel to another here uh, on the fly. But uh, welcome, everyone, to Hot Sheet. I'm not going to reiterate because that was perfectly stated there by JJ, but we're super excited to team up with Baseball America. Of course, I'm coming from the foul territory side. But uh, this is, in my mind exactly what people want, whether you're an in-depth prospect fan or more of a kind of casual prospect observer. You want to know about some of the top end guys. You want to know how your organization is doing. You want to know what the draft looks like. We'll talk to Carlos Colazzo later. We're going to talk to Ben Badler soon. So JJ, of course, we're really excited to team up with you. And the other addition to what you'll get from a video perspective right from the jump is prospect profiles. Some of those are already up on the Baseball America YouTube channel, and you will see those continuously throughout the season. When a player gets called up, we'll release more information on that particular prospect right away. So there are already breakdowns from you and from Carlos Colazzo about players like Wyatt Langford and Cole Keith and Michael Bush and many others that people can check out oh, after Jackson this Churio. Show. We got to give the shout out to Jackson Churio, the youngest player in the majors right now. Yes, very good call. Jackson Churio as well. Do you have a favorite, before we dive into everything, a favorite rookie right now that you're most excited to watch that you've been following for a long time? I would say that Churio's hard enough to beat because from a BA world, from a Baseball America world, Josh Norris, one of our uh, prospect writers for many a year, he gets excited every now and then about a prospect, but I'll never forget. I mean, this was like, this was kind of almost like this time two years ago. And I guess it was a week later than this, but he comes back from like the first night of seeing the Carolina Mudcats first week of the season. And he's like, I've seen the best player that I'm going to see all year. And it's like, it's a little, little early. I mean, we it's the first week of the season and Josh like, Nope, I've, I've done it. I've seen it. And right away you start hearing all this buzz about Jackson Trio about this guy who's in low a who kind of, I mean, wasn't not on the radar, but was very, very low on the radar before that. And, Boom, you know, we put him in our top 100 right away, uh, you know, I, I think next month, uh, like 42, and you turn around by the end of the year, he's one of the top prospects in the game. That's one of the things that gets all of us at Baseball America uh, excited every day is we want to be hearing about that next player. We want to be diving in, kind of finding out that insight into who's going to be the stars of tomorrow, 
Shorio is one who's done it very quickly. Uh, and again, that's one of those where it's always exciting when you see a player like that go from kind of obscure to household name and multimillionaire, in, in the case of Jackson Shorio, thanks to his contract extension, in a very short period of time. You'll find out updates about BA's list. So the top 100 on Friday will put out an update. So make sure you obviously subscribe to Baseball America to get all of the great content on their website. But let's hit our first move. Yes. And we will bring in our first guest, a part of the BA fam, Ben Badler, joining us right now to go over that new top 100. Ben, first off, welcome to the party and to the first edition of Hot Sheet. Are you excited? Yeah, thanks guys. I'm fired up. Thank you. Well, let's get right into it. So first off, um, Justin Foscue uh, is promoted to the big leagues for the Texas Rangers. Is he potentially going to be on this top 100 list? I know maybe he's been kind of a fringe guy and there's, there's one great part of his game and there's one part that's been lacking. So what can you tell us about him? Yeah, I mean, he definitely deserves this opportunity. I mean, it's not quite Michael Bush levels of like, get this guy some playing time. But I mean, we're talking about somebody who has, I think, close to 250 games now between double A uh, and triple A. Uh, he's very advanced offensively, especially in terms of his approach. He makes really good, dis really good swing decisions. Decisions You can see it throughout his minor league track record where he's consistently uh, walking just as much or even more than he strikes out. Uh, he doesn't swing and miss much. The I think the question marks on his game are going to be around, uh, one, his defense. Uh, you know, he's played a lot of second base, some third base, but uh, I think really uh, he's definitely more of an offensive-minded player. I think we're talking about probably a, a first baseman uh, in a, a best fit for him long term. And then the question mark is, okay, if he's going to be a first baseman, does he have the power that you ideally want if you want to – have an everyday first baseman. Uh, I, I think that's a question mark, but you're looking at somebody who, uh, you know, has really good bat to ball skills and a great sense for, for the strike zone too. So uh, an ideal outcome, he can be a really high on base uh, first baseman who can hopefully hit for, you know, 20 plus home run power, I think. The thing that jumps out to me about this also though, is, is this is the sign of an organization that's in good shape, which they're, they're the World Series champs. I mean, they just, you know, just got their rings. So it's not a shock. But to lose a guy like Josh Young, you know, for a significant period of time is a potentially crippling blow. I mean, he was one of their, you know, he was one of their better, uh, their better hitters last year. And I think the Rangers are going to be able to survive this. I think it'll be a little bit of Foscue. It'll be a little bit of they have, they have Ezekiel Duran, who, you know, they have Josh Smith, they have other guys and then they they've kind of have this outfield depth where they kind of have kind of four guys for three spots now that Wyatt Langford's up is in joining Evan Carter. This is a team that has the depth to survive things like this. And I, I say that because not every team can. Not every team is positioned to where a regular goes down like this and you say, okay, do we have answers already uh, available? And, and in the Rangers' case, yeah, they, they do. Now, as you as Ben said, the question is going to be with Foscue is. is how much are they going to kind of where, you know, where are they going to fit him in defensively? Are they going to be comfortable with him playing regularly? You know, not at first base, but over, uh, you know, over at, at third, or are they going to be more of like kind of picking his spots and kind of moving other guys around as well? And just a reminder to everyone in the chat. Yes, I'm seeing your questions. We'll get to some of those at the end. I think this is a popular question, JJ. Jackson Holiday still in his cozy little spot. Yeah, I, I, I will give that away. We're, you know, we're not going to give away the whole hundred today, but I'll give away that we're not changing who's number one when we roll out our kind of it, our minor league double A and class A uh, opening day uh, update. Jackson Holiday is still going to be number one. There is a really good top five, I would say right now, but there's really nothing that's happened. There's nothing that would change the idea of Jackson Holiday was number one when we did this in January. And if anything, I feel even better about that now than I did when we did it in January. And I felt pretty good about it in January. Ben, your thoughts? Yeah, like JJ said, he was number one coming into the year. He certainly hasn't done anything to uh, to change that or to reduce the way we feel about him. It's, uh, I mean, this was a guy who was a high school draft pick uh, just a little less than two years ago. He was already in AAA, should be, I think, in the big league soon. It's a... Uh, you know, beautiful left-handed swing. It stays through the hitting zone for a long time. Great 
feel for the strike zone, swings at good pitches, doesn't swing and miss when he is swinging uh, at those balls in the strike zone. And, uh, you know, you look at him and it's not like he's some big physically imposing guy too, but he has a lot of bat speed. I think there's a chance for a 20, 25 home run type guy there. So, yeah, I think he's going to be, you know, for a lot of teams, he'd be their shortstop of the future. For the Orioles, it's uh, probably going to be second base. But, yeah, I think as soon as he comes up, he's going to be an impact player right away. I want to finish up with a couple of pitchers. Yeah, go ahead, JJ. I I just wanted to add on that. Like the one thing about Jackson is this. I think if his – if his face was not so young looking, his physicality would stand out more. I agree with Ben. He's not hes not his brother. His brother is kind of who might be the number one pick in the draft in a couple of years, might be the, is the more physically imposing of the two uh, Holiday brothers. But I would say like he has gotten bigger and bigger to where like, yeah, there's real power in there down the road. There's real some real power you see already, but I think it's really going to kind of grow into it. But he's got this face that makes it look like he's, you know, he's he's even younger than he's he's incredibly young for a guy who's knocking on the door of the big leagues, but he's got that that you look at him and you go, is this guy 18, you know, 17? And it's no, he's he's 20, but uh but I think that that physicality is just going to keep getting uh, better and better. Is that in the scattering report by the way, punished for his baby face holding him back? from true <laughs> physicality bragging rights at the moment. <laughs> it's kind of a little cherubic almost, but you know, again, he is, uh, he's also, it also kind of belies just how advanced he is because you see him and he looks, you know, again, pretty young, but this is a guy who usually is, seems like he's a step ahead of everyone else on the field, even though he's usually the youngest player on whatever team he plays on. All right, so here's a youngster in the big leagues right now, Ben Badler, Jared Jones. Up to the show, we spoke to him on foul territory last week, and he felt like he had a 50-50 shot to crack the roster, and he looked pretty damn good picking up the punch outs in his first start game number three of the season, a win for the Pittsburgh Pirates. So is he going to fly up the list? Uh, Well, I don't see him going back down to the minors anytime soon. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think we had really good reports on him coming into the year, um, and it's just been even... Uh, just been even better. I think the we always knew the fastball was there. It's, uh, you know, mid to high 90s fastball with a lot of carry on it. So you see him get a lot of swing and miss up in the zone. Uh, and then we had a, you know, had a slider graded out plus coming into the year, uh, watching it coming, uh, you know, watching it already against big league hitters uh, with the way he's using it, uh, with the increased usage of it to this year. I think that's been really effective for him. It's a big weapon for him against lefties or righties. Uh, may have to revise the grade up a little bit uh, on his slider. I think that's been a little bit better uh, than expected. So the, to see him come in right away and get the amount of swing and miss that he has against major league hitters uh, has been really, really encouraging. The, the thing that stood out to me was, is in, we, you were talking about the swing and miss on his fastball, and we talk about the carry. There were a lot of really tardy swings that you saw from Marlins hitters in that game. Like There were guys who seemed like they knew the fastball was coming, but they still couldn't catch up to it, which – that's a really encouraging sign. I mean, he is kind of that 97, 98. We've seen 100 from him already uh, in spring training. But to to then add to that, that slider that he was, he was dotting it. He was getting it in under the hands of lefties. He was using it against both lefties and righties. It's a pretty devastating, you know, two-pitch combo. He did show that he also could throw in a curveball, that he could throw in a changeup as well. But you put this all together, and yeah, we thought – wow, this is a guy who really took a step forward last year, but it's a guy who took another step in this offseason, and boom, here we go now. Seeing some comments mixed in here. Carlos Colazzo saying, <laughs> 70 grade vocab with JJ dropping cherubic. And I did see a question about Spencer Jones and a reply in the chat from BA saying that Jones is 74 on the top 100 right now. Expect that to change on Friday. I would imagine, JJ, that is going to change in a positive direction for him. Yes. If it goes, if he changes, it'll go up, not down. I can promise you that. Um, that's a, This is the next Yankees big prospect. You know, We've seen, obviously, Jason Dominguez, who's now re- rehabbing from Tommy John surgery, who made it to the big leagues last year. It's, it's hard not with, with Spencer to kind of compare him to Aaron Judge, not because we think that he's going to be Aaron Judge, but he is – an athletic outfielder who's also ginormous, gigantic, um, towering, whatever adjective you want to use. Like, 
whenever you saw Aaron Judge, you know, when Aaron Judge was in the minors, he just stood out like this is this player is a, a different size than everyone else on the field. I wouldn't go that Spencer Jones is all that way to Judge, but he's not much different from that as far as being kind of one of the bigger guys out there who also has legit power and athleticism to go with it. You know, I, I still think there are some things for him to clean up. Kind of, he's going to be ticketed for a double A Somerset, and and I, I think that there's you, you need some more time. But at the same time, this is you know Ben to me. This is a guy who does have really high ceiling, and if it all comes together, could be pretty special. Yeah, it's hard to find comparable players. We're talking about somebody who's six foot seven with that kind of uh, freakish combination of both athleticism and, like you said, ginormous power, too. <laughs> I mean, Last exit below at the top yeah. of the scale. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Yankees also know how to develop a massive athletic outfield prospect. So he's got someone good to look up to. So we'll talk a lot more about Spencer Jones, I'm sure, as this show rolls along throughout the season before he gets up to the show. Uh, Jackson Job, I want to finish with him. So um, how impressive was he in spring training in your mind, Ben, and another guy that I would expect to move along up the list? Yeah, we saw him in you know short bursts in spring training where the velocity was up uh, a little bit from where it was last year. I mean, last year we had him you know into the upper 90s. This year, touching 100, uh, I think there was a 101, maybe even a 102 in spring training this season. So I would expect his already very good fastball to, uh, you know, not be sitting in the upper 90s or, or you know, below 100s as a starter. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a tick up. But e even if it's not during the regular season, uh, this is a guy who I ch think has a chance to be a frontline starter, a chance to be uh, a true number one starter. Um, I, I think he and Paul Skeens right now are the two best pitching prospects in baseball. Uh, obviously, everybody saw the velocity in spring training. And then everybody since he's been or, you know, since he's been a draft prospect has been so excited about uh, the slider, uh, you know, flashes as a well above average pitch, 3000 plus RPM. But uh, I think his changeup is one of the best changeups in the minor leagues, too. He gets a ton of swing and miss on that pitch. So, uh, you know, you add everything up, uh, the fastball, the slider, the changeup, everything grinding out plus or better. Uh, from an athletic pitcher who throws a ton of strikes uh, and was really, really dominant last season. Uh, I mean, even if the even if we're seeing the same velocity we saw last year, I'm excited. But uh, even if, now, if we're seeing a little bit more, yeah, I, I think this guy has a chance to uh, to be a true number one. It, it's weird to think with a guy who actually I, uh, the Hawkeye system, which didn't track every pitch that everyone threw in the minors and in, in spring training, I should say, but. Jackson Jones 101.8 was the highest velocity track by anyone, major league or minor league or anyone in a, in a regular spring training game. And, but he's a pitcher, like he's not a thrower. He's a legit pitcher. He's a guy who knows how to set up hitters. He knows how to get hitters out in different ways. Sometimes maybe even gets a little bit too cute in kind of, sometimes you're like, okay, look, you just, just blow this guy away. But I just also like this, you know, the Tigers look frisky so far. They've had a, the first time through the rotation at the big league level, we're seeing Tarek Skubal looks like he's what he was, what we hoped he would be before he got hurt. We've seen, you know, Jack Flaherty looks like he's back to, to some level of what we saw before, what we didn't see last year. They've got Matt Manning at AAA because they've got some pitching depth right now with Job coming up not too far away. Wilmer Flores, who's a guy who kind of popped a couple of years ago, but really took a step back while well, he was, hitting some 99s again in spring training. I kind of feel like that this Tigers team is one that when we talked about Scott kind of in the intro that we're going to tell you about organizations who are on the way up. This is one who is on the way up. They have utterly revamped, I would say, on the pitching, hitting, scouting, player development, all of the above over the last couple of years. And we're seeing some positive results from that. And Jackson Job is the guy who could be the most positive result. I almost kind of want to wrap him in bubble wrap because the thing that we get worried about with a a young pitcher who's this good is please just stay healthy. Please mm -hmm. just don't get hurt. And that's the biggest, the biggest concern you can have with Jackson Job is, is just can we get him from where he is now to age 25, 26, 27, just taking regular starts. And the sphere of hip hop in the chat that Scoogle's my dark horse AL side pick. So if you've got Scoogle dominating throughout the season, Jackson Job coming up at some point to a rotation that looks pretty good so far. We'll see how Casey Mize looks in his first start of the season. 
Tigers can make some noise in the AL Central. Ben, great to have you on, and we're excited to have you on throughout the season on Hot Sheet. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Back to JJ and myself just for a moment, and then we're going to dive into the draft. And, of course, I was already checking out the chat and seeing questions from fans about draft hype and about a particular player that we promised that we would get to. So let's do that. Our next segment's called Helium Spot. Carlos Colazzo, we need your help. It's time to talk draft. So let's get into it because mock drafts are a big part of the Baseball America world. And um, I think people are already kind of looking forward to what their team might put together when it comes to draft season in July at the All-Star break. And people are excited watching college baseball and thinking about what the possibilities could be, especially when we have players that shined last year in college baseball that are already making a major impact in this game. That includes Wyatt Langford. I'm sure we're going to see Paul Skeens at some point in the next few months. Carlos, great to see you. And where are we at in terms of mock draft world? What's up, guys? Uh, great to be here. Yeah, the mocks are actually already rolling in season, which feels crazy since we have several months to go until the draft. We actually had our first in-season mock of the year. A few weeks ago, we had Charlie Condon, Georgia outfielder, third baseman, first baseman. He's really played all over the field so far this spring. He's in that top spot, but I do think it is still fairly wide open at this stage in the draft class. We kind of entered the year with a wide open field. Um, there have been some players who have moved up the board. There have been some players who have gotten injured and dealt with uh, maybe a little bit less performance than you would like to see. A few pitchers are even entering the top of the draft class conversation. So it is still fairly wide open. I'd say today, if the draft were to happen, Charlie Condon, Travis Bazana, um, those would probably be the favorites right now for 1-1, but it's been a fun draft to follow. And I imagine that'll only continue uh, as we keep getting into really the full um, kind of meat of conference play here. Let's spend some more time on Charlie Condon right now because of what he's doing on a historic level in the college baseball world. JJ, your observations of him thus far, and are you getting a lot of questions all over, you know, BA socials and on the website about him? I, I feel like I'm getting more questions than most because I am a UGA grad myself. So uh, I have some <laughs> UGA fan friends. Um, someone pointed out to me, uh, we got to do a piece about this, that, that, there aren't many schools out there. UCLA's one. I think there are a couple of others who've had a number one pick in the football, basketball, and baseball drafts. Georgia has multiple football players who've gone 1-1. They've had a number one basketball player, which is surprising considering Georgia basketball history, in Anthony Edwards. And Charlie Condon would mean that if he went 1-1 that they would actually have the baseball then. But what Condon's done so far is kind of almost hard to fully wrap your brain around because he's hitting over 500 and leading the, the country in home runs. And currently, now again, it's only halfway through the season, but his slugging percentage would set the NCAA Division I record at the same time. So we haven't had anyone hit 500 in a very long time in Division I baseball. We haven't had anyone slug anything like this pretty much ever. Pete Cavilia had a year he hit 49 homers, I believe 48 homers, you know, and he didn't slug this high as Charlie Condon has so far. Now, if you aren't paying a whole lot of attention to college baseball, we should note that offense is back at where it was kind of in the uh, the gorilla ball era. We are talking, you know, seven runs per team per game. You are seeing a lot of 20 to 15 games, 15 to nothing run rules, all that. So it is an offensive game in, in college baseball right now, Carlos. But that being said, it still doesn't explain and it still doesn't diminish what Charlie Condon's doing so far at the plate. Not at all. And I think even if you compare Condon to some of the home run leaders in the last few years, he stacks up with those players. He's on pace, the same pace that Jack Caglione was a year ago when he led all Division One hitters with 33 home runs. He's well ahead of the pace that Ivan Melendez was, uh, who led college baseball and home runs two years ago. So even in this home run inflated environment, he, he's well on the pace to get to 30 plus. I think considering his pure hitting ability, the advances that he's made with his approach and some of the contact ability. I mean, he is absolutely annihilating fastballs 92 plus, and he hasn't even really faced the full sort of bucket of, of quality heaters that he's going to see this year as he gets through conference play a little bit more. I would expect the average to dip below 
500. Uh, I guess that seems kind of insane that he is still hitting 500 this far into the season. Um, but no, he has 70 grade raw power um, and is probably a plus hitter at this point. That kind of elite offensive package makes him one of the running favorites to be the one, one selection. And yeah, regardless of the offensive environment, it's pretty obvious to see just how powerful and strong uh, Charlie Condon is. So you mentioned he's played third, he's played left, he's played center, he's played right, he's played first. How much does that factor? One of the concerns we had kind of coming into this year with this draft class was we had a lot of guys at the top of the class who were seen, Condon included, as kind of more pure bats without a whole lot of defensive value or Mm -hmm. second baseman in a number of cases. Has Condon, by playing a little bit of everywhere, has that helped kind of ease some of those concerns or is that not really making much different because he's probably not going to be a center fielder long term. I I think absolutely. He he probably isn't going to be a center fielder. It's been fun to see him play that position recently in the last few series that Georgia has had. Um, But really the, the number one thing for him to improve entering this year was just showing defensive versatility. One of my favorite pieces we do each season is just looking at the first round players entering the year and kind of looking at where are the areas they can improve. That defensive versatility was a real question with Condon. He had played mostly first base last year with Georgia, which was his first season on the field as a redshirt sophomore this year. Um, And like you said, he's played third, he's played left, he's played right, he's played center. And scouts have thought he's looked pretty good uh, moving around the field. He is more athletic, I think, than people expected him to be, whether or not he improved significantly over the offseason or it was just always there. He's now getting a chance to showcase it. Um, I think that is maybe up for debate. But regardless, he's he's looked really good. Um, and this offensive profile at a corner outfield position, I think, just makes you a little bit more excited than if you knew for sure he has to play first base. So he's going to get drafted based on the hitting ability and the power. Um, but the fact that you can play him in a number of b- different positions just makes the, the the package that more appealing. Hey, Carlos, I know that the bonus pool money was announced today. So what can you tell us? And did anything stand out about it? Yeah, so the bonus pools came out. That's obviously really important for baseball's draft, just given the dynamics that it works with, um, ha- kind of how the players are selected. Uh, but the Guardians, maybe to no surprise, are number one with an $18 million pool. Um, that was maybe not too surprising, just given them picking at the very top, the fact that they've got a couple extra picks. Uh, you've got Cincinnati and Colorado, two and three. Again, not too surprising. They're top three. Um, you do flip Colorado and Cincinnati. Um, just given some of the extra picks and the fact that Colorado will be picking earlier in subsequent rounds after we get out of the first round, which is impacted by the draft lottery. The team that I kind of want to point out here, though, is Arizona. They're picking at 29, just given how far they went, obviously, into the World Series. They have a $12 million pool, more than $12 million pool. That's more money than all of the teams that are picking in the 18 to 30 round range. Um That's because they have a PPI pick that they got because of Corbin Carroll that added almost $3 million to their pool. That's because they also have a comp pick or a supplemental first round pick shortly after that as well. So they have a lot of of leverage and bonus pool money to throw around relative to all of the teams picking around them. Maybe that's a chance for them to be a little bit more creative. Maybe they can slide a player who really fits in the middle of the first round and they can offer an overslot deal to get him to the back of the first round. Maybe they take a Mariners approach like last year and really just stack uh, high upside high school players with those first three picks, go over slot and then save money later. Um, but I always love when the bonus pools come out. You can really maybe figure out the teams to watch Seattle or, or St. Louis picking seven, I think would be another team to mention. They kind of have the inverse problem that the D backs have. They don't have uh, as much bonus pool money as all of the other teams picking in the top 12. So maybe they're at a disadvantage picking in the top 10. So this is always just kind of interesting to look into. And now we kind of have the financials here. Um, But it's a lot of money at the top. There's $9 million in slot value for each of the first three picks. And just last year was the first two years where we had any players sign for $9 million plus. I'm I'm going to give the basics here. Uh, You know, if you're watching this, you're like, so what exactly are the bonus pools in in the MLB draft? Just... This is very important in the MLB draft because in baseball, you can spend up to your allotment if you sign all the players for one through 10, you know, rounds one through 10. And that doesn't mean that you have to spend it on each individual pick. It is the pool of money that you have to spend. But you, the, the penalties for going over it, um, over 5%, over 4.99%, are such that no MLB team has ever been willing to exceed that. So this really is because you lose draft picks. So this really is, this is kind of not just 
picking at the top of the draft is obviously very valuable because you get to pick before other teams do. But like Carlos said, like when you have a team like Arizona who picks later but has more money to spend, there is some freedom with that because players do fall. We are talking about a draft where high school players and even college players in a lot of cases can go back to school. So signability does play a role in this, especially because you lose. If you don't sign your first round pick, you get a pick the next year, but you lose that pool allotment for that year's draft, for the draft you're in. So there's a lot of signability concerns with this. Having a bigger pool just gives you a lot more ammunition to do things you want to do in the draft. And the, the team also that jumps out to me on this, we are talking about, we're talking about a draft lottery now. We're talking about a situation where the worst teams in baseball do not get guaranteed the top picks the next year, which we had for a long time in baseball. We not only have that though, we now have a situation where if you have two lottery picks in a row as a team that gets uh, you know revenue sharing money, you don't get a third pick. So that's why Oakland wasn't even, you know gets hammered because of that. Uh, but Cincinnati standing out where they do. Cincinnati having the third largest bonus pool of any team out there really does jump jump out to me because this is a team that should be kind of contending this year and is going to have kind of their choice of one of the top players in this class and really the ability to spend a lot of money in this draft that kind of is going to give them almost kind of the flexibility to maybe make some moves at the deadline that you wouldn't kind of be willing to do in another situation. But if you're adding one of the top players in the class, a, a top 100 prospect right away, maybe a couple even, that's going to give you the freedom if you need to make that move to bulk up the outfield, for instance, uh, or you know to fill in for a pitching injury here or there. They're going to have some ammunition to do that in a way that a team who's picking 25 or 30 might not have the same uh, opportunity. Lots of draft talk over the next few months. Carlos, great to have you on here. We will uh, be chatting quite frequently leading up to the draft. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Awesome to have you on. Carlos Calaza, you can check out, obviously, all of his work. You know, he posts all of his articles on Twitter and is keeping up with the draft as well as anyone on the planet. All right, so on the college baseball front, JJ, let's finish with an updated look at the top 25 and Arkansas stays strong. Arkansas number one again, and the thing that jumps out with them, we talked about Charlie Condon, but you could we could have easily focused our draft talk this week about Hagen Smith as well. Uh, the Razorbacks have probably the best weekend rotation right now in, in, in college baseball. I kind of thought that might be weight coming into the year, but you could say that Arkansas has been as good, if not better than that so far. And with this pitching staff that Arkansas has, it really does look like they have the staying power. They're number one right now. It's midway through the season. But it kind of would be a surprise at this point if they're not in Omaha. It's always hard to get there. But this is the team that looks built to not just go to Omaha, but to, to hang out for a long time, enjoy a lot of, uh, of the Drover and, and, you know, and, and everything else in, in Omaha and probably sit through a couple of uh, lightning delays and rain delays uh, you know, this, this, this postseason. This is the team to watch. And again, we are now in the meat of conference play. So every weekend, we're getting a lot of shakeups. We've seen a lot of shakeups already over the last few weeks in the top 25. If you have college baseball questions, we'll take them throughout the week and get to them next week on Hot Sheet. We'll take one question before we finish up. Northsider Geo wants to know about the pitcher the Cubs just called up, and that is Ben Brown, who's one of the better pitchers in their system and now 24 years old. So do the Cubs have something special here? I know it was kind of like a weird way to introduce him, but is he going to be an impact player in the big leagues this year? He's a great story because this is kind of like a slow cook, a slow burner. Like Ben Brown was a guy who was a Phillies prospect who, who kind of, you know, we had a lot of players who injuries, COVID, all that kind of, kind of slowed their development. But Ben Brown was pretty high on that list of guys who kind of were just kind of chugging along, chugging along. And then you turn around, boom, this guy's a big prospect. I think he's kind of well positioned to help the Cubs this year. I don't think that they need him to be like anything more than a useful arm right there. Like I know in his first, uh, first outing, I believe was, you know, he had a little bit of Rocky, uh, you know, some rockiness to it, but this is a guy who should contribute to him this year. And, and I say this, the thing I love about this Cubs team is, is I feel like Brown is one of many Cubs prospects who should be able to help at some point this year. We've got to keep an eye. We're, we're seeing Chris Morrell already from last year came up, but we've got Owen Casey coming. We've got Cade Horton coming. We've got an, and obviously he's not, he's, he's rookie eligible, but he's not a prospect, but we saw obviously a great first outing by uh, Shoto Imanaga, which was 
I mean, incredible in, in his debut. This is a team that it, the, the NL Central is wide open, but I, I think that we, we've seen already that the Cubs, the Brewers, the Reds, maybe even the Pirates, this may be a lot more interesting division than maybe a lot of people would have thought in the offseason. Yeah, the Reds had all the rookies last year. The Cubs have quite a few. We mentioned the pitching and eventually Kevin Alcantara and Casey and mm -hmm. many others on that front too. And then um, the Pirates obviously have been rebuilding for a while. So you'd expect that to change and for them to kind of keep getting the reinforcements in the big leagues to see if that can support their hot start. So uh, Prospect Wire is also available for fans. want to let them know what Baseball America has on that front because it is uh, free. Free for everyone, uh, you know. Our we're updating that literally daily. Uh, you know, I, I can't stay off of it. I updated it all weekend. <laughs> when you see player moves, when you say injuries, when you see big, you know, big performances, when you see guys who's really struggle, we're highlighting it all in the prospect wire. It is is a perfect way, and we have stats on there also for all these guys. Perfect way to keep up. Like you said, if you're an in-depth fan or you're a little bit more of a casual fan, but you want to know about what the prospects are doing, perfect way to do it. Check out the prospect wire at Baseball America. If you missed this, you can check it out, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your pods audio-wise. Please like and subscribe uh, to the Baseball America YouTube channel. A lot more content like this coming your way throughout the season. And again, JJ, uh, congratulations on both sides here. We're excited to work together and uh, you did it. First, uh, first hot sheet ever. One in the books, many, many more to come. Yes, exactly. Draft coverage, prospect coverage every single week. Send in your questions. Thanks everyone. We will see you next week on Hot Sheet.